Good evening. We're going to go ahead and start the meeting. Uh, my name is Tracy Schultz. I'm the chair of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Co Reconstruction Advisory Group. I'm opening the meeting of the advisory group and hereby I call the meeting to order at 6.05 p.m. We are holding this meeting in person at the MDTA Police Building at the Bay Bridge. I'd like to thank everybody for showing up in person like they could after all this COVID mess been going through. So I appreciate everybody that can make it tonight. Okay, um, attendees should note that this meeting is being recorded, as you can see, by Queen Anne's TV, and I'm not sure about who else, but it will be available on the Bragg webpage after the meeting for attendees to view and download. Attendees should also note that the recording will include the audio, video, and presentations from this evening's meeting. I would ask that anyone in the room with us this evening please refrain from speaking unless you are presenting or answering questions so that background noise is minimized for those viewing remotely. And by check their phones to put them on uh, vibrate if you could please. If members of the public pre-register to comment on a specific agenda item, I will provide you with an opportunity to comment after the agenda item is presented. We appreciate everyone's patience and ask that you hold any comments until the designated time. We ask that you introduce yourself by giving us your name and the community that you represent before moving on with your question or comment. Members of the public join us via Microsoft Teams. We'll be able to view the meeting only. For security reasons, the chat function in Microsoft Teams is not enabled for MDOT personnel. Any posts entered in the chat window are not visible to staff and will not be responded to. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded in its entirety. For the record, all members are present except for Mr. Cheney, I know he's not here. Cheney, Jim yeah, Moran. Just, um, Mr. Jim Port's here. And Jim Moran. Mr. Jim Moran's not here. I'm not sure if uh, Melissa might have any other names, but. Yeah, I don't think so. Okay, we're good on that then. Okay. Uh, since our last meeting, we had a, a new member joining to replace uh, Mr. L Michael Lord. And I welcome Mr. Brad Cole to the Bragg, who will serve the remainder of Mr. Lord's term. I ask that everyone please introduce themselves for his benefit. So I'll start with myself. With Mr. Jim Moran, he's coming in. So hey. right here. Oh Over here. Guys. Yeah. Hmm. So I'll start myself and go to my right. I'm Tracy Schultz, I'm the chair. I'm from Canal. I'm in the Canal Volunteer Fire Department. I have business on the Eastern Shore. So I've been here since the start of the Bragg years and years ago. Just three of us. Yeah, three of us. <laughs> uh, Barbara Hitchings, and I'm the vice chair. And as Tracy said, the three of us have been, oh, Nick too, four of us have been on Bragg since the inception of it. And I represent the Broadneck Peninsula. I'm Kurt Regal, um, representing, I guess, Anne Arundel County and the city of Annapolis. Sean Powell, Deputy Secretary of Operations for the Department of Transportation. Tim Smith, uh, MDOT State Highway Administrator. Brad Cole, live here in the uh, nearby in the Padickery Point neighborhood and uh, representing the Anne Arundel County side. Donald Schloss, I live in Annapolis and I am newly appointed. Steve Wilson, Queen Anne County Commissioner. Jim Moran, Queen Anne's County Commissioner. Nick Diotis from Queenstown, a commuter. Jack Broderick, uh, Kent Highland, and uh, like several of these guys, uh, it's been my honor to have been on the brag since uh, day one and uh, look forward to continuing for a bit. Thank you. Okay. Our next agenda item is a review of the minutes. Has everybody a chance to review the minutes? Is there any changes from anybody? Can get any emails or comments back? A yeah. few from Melissa. Uh, no, I have Jim on the speakerphone. We're having some technical difficulties, so I'll just. Okay. Yeah, Melissa, can you hear me? Yeah, no. you're you're in the room with everybody. Thank you. Okay, Jim Ports, Executive Director, MDTA. Okay. okay, thank you. So there's no changes to the meeting minutes. We have a motion. To motion. Accept. Motion to approve the minutes. Second. Motion by Jim. Second. Second by Nick. Okay, next is our um, requirement of House Bill 56, which is a report on the group's activities since the last meeting and any recommendations they have based on those activities. As for Bragg duties, they are to provide the MDTA with an independent citizen informed perspective of the authority's operations at the Bay Bridge, assess potential concerns about activity at the Bay Bridge, educate the public about activity relating to the Bay Bridge, and work with the MDTA and provide pertinent input related to traffic and customer issues. 
Would any members like to share their individual educational activities, interactions with their communities since the last meeting? I'll start one. Um, I attended at uh, Canal Firehouse. Richard every year has a uh, renewal of the route, Maryland Route 8, Route 18 plan, which is a plan for the Canal area. If there is an incident that it happens on the Bay Bridge that will affect traffic on the eastern shore, figuring over a long period of time. Um, so we had a meeting with that, and the plan was updated, and everything was good with that. So uh, I have an email group, somewhere between 40 and 50 people. Most of them are on the Broadneck area, or in the Broadneck area, but uh, some of them are from the northern part of the county, some from the southern part of the county, and some they are kind of spread out all over, but, and they uh, are interested in the operations of the Bay, Bay Bridge and traffic, et cetera. So, I usually send them out information as I get it. And I also belong to the uh, Broadneck Community, uh, Broadneck Council of Communities, get that straight. And I report to them at our meetings uh, when they are held. Mr. Regal? Yes. Um, my principal inter interaction has been with uh, two boards and commissions. Um, I'm chairman of the Annapolis Transportation Board, and I keep them informed of uh, activities concerning the bridge. And I sit in on meetings of the Anne Arundel County Transportation Commission, too. So those are my principal interactions. Good feedback from you all. You yeah, interact yeah, every day. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, every day. <laughs> Mr. Cole? No. Do you have anything you just new on the board? But if you want to I'm getting up to speed. I attended the Broadneck Council of Communities meeting a couple of weeks ago where uh, Mr. Ports gave a report. And uh, I've been in touch with our councilwoman, District 5 councilwoman, Amanda Fiedler. I will uh, be uh, coordinating with her after, before and after these meetings. And um, with, with Barbara Hitchings, we're both on the Anne Arundel County side, and so I plan to work with her to help communicate with whoever is interested. Okay, Mr. Schloss. Uh, this is my second meeting. I've been uh, getting caught up with the minutes from previous meetings, and uh, I hope to be able to interact where we're needed. Very good, thank you. Sir. Uh, I would think Queen Anne's County is uh, very concerned with everything that happens on the bridge because of the uh, continual problems we've had and will continue to have. And I think um, one of the things we're very interested to hear is any changes in the outlook from Broadneck and the Anne Arundel folks as to their reception of uh, future plans for the bridge. and. Uh, with that, I will hand the ball to my compatriot, Mr. Moran. Well, I would say that uh, first and foremost, our last meeting, uh, Queen Anne's County uh, adopted a resolution in support of a replacement bridge uh, with a whole litany of, of reasons why it needs to happen sooner rather than later. Uh, I've had the privilege in the, in the last uh, two months to three months to meet with Councilwoman Fiedler uh, and County Executive uh, Stuart Pittman and you know just two nights ago was the time two nights ago uh, I sat in and testified in, in Annapolis uh, for Anne Arundel County's same version of that uh, resolution supporting a replacement bridge uh, sooner rather than later later and look forward to working with uh, our counterparts in Anne Arundel County to help in any way possible to streamline the the process and also to you know, pick off some of these <laughs> nagging issues that uh, we both face as far as traffic and congestion. So we're looking forward to working with MDTA and the state uh, on, on some of these different issues. So very good. Um, as a commuter, and I guess how long, how long has this group been? Since 2013 or something? Three. 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 Yeah. Three. Yeah. <laughs> As a commuter, all those years that I've been on the group, in the group, 2003, I uh, com communicate a lot with the commissioners. Um, basically, have two dozen people that'll pick up the phone and call when there's a problem with the bridge. They expect to know what's going on. They want information. 
So, you know, I gather information on backups, delays, especially people coming from Ocean City and want to pass through, and just share all that, you know, network that uh, with the telephones. And there are a few websites locally in Kent Island, and uh, Bennett Point has a, what is it, Facebook now. I'm not in Facebook, uh, but I let my wife handle that Facebook stuff. <laughs> <laughs> she said I'd get in trouble if I was on Facebook. But, and we just, you know, share in, 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 in the, the information. And hopefully it helps people. <clears throat> Broderick? Yeah, Jack, <clears throat> excuse me, Jack Broderick. I live on uh, Kent Island in Chester, but involved in a number of different uh, organizations. I think what Nick said, I would echo, you know, the networking part of this thing is, uh, is really important. Sharing information that we can glean and insight from here. Uh, and then providing feedback. Uh, oftentimes, like Nick, you know, I'll, I'll get phone calls and people assume because you're involved in this, you know what's going on. Well, sometimes that's true, sometimes it's not. But I think this is an opportunity to, to be at the table and try to understand what's going on. Um, <clears throat> I get feedback from the uh, heritage perspective, the tourism perspective, and from the uh, uh, the community perspective generally. And I have to say, and I mentioned this at our, our last meeting, but the effort this year uh, to tie communications and operations together on the part of uh, MBTA has been very well received uh, out in the community. You know, you can, sometimes those emails might seem like a pain in the butt when you get like six or eight in an afternoon, but they're keeping you updated. And folks are continuously asking, you know, what what's going on now? That thing last Sunday with the overturn deal. I mean, there's a flash out, there's a problem, um, and then it was an update of what the problem was, and then the vehicle's just been cleared. That's very helpful. So I, I think, just overall, the uh, the specific groups are important, but the the networking between the groups and between this level is really, uh, I, I think it's really very important, and, and we're continuing to be able to do that. Thank you, Richard, for what you do up here. Okay. Next on agenda is updates on current projects. MT, MDTA Chief Engineer, Mr. Jim Harkness, and MDOT SHA Administrator, Mr. Tim Smith. So I'm not sure which one of you want to go first, but before you go, I'd like to say thank you all for all you've done this summer to help with move traffic. Sometimes it seems worse, sometimes it seems better. On the Eastern Shore, I think Sundays have been better and stuff, but um, some days you can't stop people from driving and causing problems. But, and one of the things that we've done is um, before they go it, is it, like our internal alert system from SHA and MDTA is we start tracking it a little farther back so we can see, see the, hey, you know, back in Easton what's coming our way or back from Salisbury to Easton. So it helps the, the chart teams prepare as they're coming forward. And we, we did a little trial over the last two or three weekends on that. And it seems like that's really working to, to prep because we expected a very large volume coming through over the last couple of weekends. It seems like it's, whatever you're doing is working. So we appreciate everything you've done. Yeah, Tim's team at SHA had, had you know, gone out and had a little above and beyond and created a few more areas that we can uh, they start tracking. So. Very good. So I'm not sure. I'll let Mr. Harkness go with the better haircut. Not very much. Go come up front. Mr. Cheney's seat. And have us. All right. Do that. That'll make it easier. Thank you. <laughs> like making it easy. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair and board members. Uh, for the record, my name is Jim Harkness, Chief Engineer, um, MDTA, and uh, we'll just be going over. Uh, my report on the capital projects on the Bay Bridge. And so this list is, uh, I think, uh, mainly unchanged uh, since our last meeting, um, with uh, only a couple of projects moving uh, maybe into construction. Um, but I'll review each of those uh, projects with you now. So the first one, BB2757, is the replacement of the 5 kV feeder on the east bounce band. Um, that project essentially is a, an electrical uh, project that will be uh, replacing, as I said, that 5 kV uh, feeder line. Um, that includes all the, the cable and uh, as well as uh, control equipment. 
uh, associated with that and all the structural um, attachments that are necessary to, to run that cable along the bridge. Um, off of the bridge, we're installing automatic transfer switches uh, and, and, and sub-gear uh, in, in the new uh, substations at, on each side of the bridge. And so basically, at the end of the day, this project is going to give us resilient uh, pallet power from either side. So we, we are currently fed uh, from both BGE and, and Delmarva. And uh, they only feed one bridge each. So if we have something go wrong, we lose uh, some power on the bridge. So this will create an, effectively create a loop that we can um, automatically transfer feeds and, uh, and lose just a small portion of the bridge instead of an entire bridge should something go, go down. <coughs> uh, this project also supports some of the, um, the, the work on the uh, on the automatic lane closure project, which is another project I'll cover. Our next project is BB 2819. Um, that is the deck rehabilitation and, and miscellaneous modifications. Um, that's the overlay project. Uh, most of you are familiar with that. Um, so uh, I think we have um, some, some computer integration for some of the, the signals that we've done and we have uh, uh, completed the integration piece on the new components for that. Um, we have under construction um, our, our lane use control signal gantries on the, on the westbound bridge and those are the, um, uh, we have 19 of those gantries and we have three that are already completed and four are currently under construction. And the goal for those, um, uh, for those gantries is uh, to complete uh, an entire gantry in 15 days. Um, so that, that kind of uh, is what is the, ma the major work r remaining on this contract. Um, and we expect to have that done uh, spring of next year. Um, let's see, we have uh, currently we'll be uh, milling that, that pavement surface on the, the westbound approach to the bridge. Uh, and, and then we'll be paving that back next week and, and maybe the following week after that. Is that a light job? Yes. All paving is going to be nighttime. nighttime work out there, yeah. Um, let's see, our next one is BB3002. That's uh, Bay Bridge Priority Repairs, Miscellaneous Modifications. So this essentially is a, a work order or a task order contract. Uh, it's what we call an on-call. It performs um, steel repairs, concrete, uh, and other miscellaneous repairs that are identified during our inspection uh, program. And, and that way we can be uh, reactive and, and get out there and, and fix, uh, address problems as they occur. So you, you can see that this project NTP'd in, in uh, 2017. So this project is actually wrapping up and um, it's being replaced by a project uh, further down in the list, uh, which is a, a essentially a, a new version of this contract. All right, our, our next project uh, is BB3007, which is to rehabilitate the uh, uh, and install some maintenance access features. So again, this project is um, uh, modifying you know, the, the, some of the features that allow us to access the bridge and certain uh, portions of the bridge underneath the roadway or uh, coming up from uh, the towers. Um, so there's catwalks and, and ladders and, and hatches and, and those type of um, equipment that is included in this contract. Um, this contract should be completed by the end of the, of the calendar year. All right. Our fifth contract on the list is BB3008. That's the Bay Bridge uh, crossover automated lane closure system. So that's on the, the eastern shore. And, and this project is um, essentially going to help with implementing uh, lane closures and uh, affecting traffic operations for the two-way, which result from uh, the demand management, um, the incidents, and uh, construction work as well. Uh, so this system consists of lane use signals, uh, the, the gantries to hold them, the signing associated with them, uh, pavement markings, uh, message signs, and cameras to sort of uh, observe everything. Um, sort of some of the work that they've accomplished recently is they're starting to uh, install some of the 
the motors that, that will move the, the, the gate swing arms back and forth. So they've completed um, the, all, the, all the foundations for those. Um, they've also got the uh, transformers, the electrical transformers installed for those. Uh, and over the next three months, they'll be working on getting the gantries uh, delivered and installed and continue with the, the gate and motor arm installations. Our next project is BB3009. That's the police uh, building generator replacement. Um, that project was just waiting on a maintenance platform, and so over the summer we received that and installed it, and so this project is in closeout. Let's see, now we move down to BB3014. That's the uh, Bay Bridge emergency AET conversion. Uh, also has the uh, East or, or the Western Shores uh, automated lane closure system as a, as a component of this uh, project. So uh, this project is uh, working to remove the old toll plaza, reconstruct some of that area, make it a truck inspection, uh, full truck inspection station. It's realigning US 50 to better align with the approach uh, of the bridge now that the, the toll plaza uh, was removed and it is creating and constructing all the same things, the lane use control signals, the signs, the gantries on, on this shore as the uh, BB 3008 was doing on the other shore. <coughs> See, recent accomplishments, they have had the foundations completed for the sign structures for the gantries. Um, they have uh, a lot of the foundations uh, and electrical vaults complete, um, and they're doing demo uh, in, in still in, the, uh, in the, the former toll plaza area. Uh, upcoming work includes some paving on, on US 50 here, so again, it's the same schedule as as for the 2819 project, they'll be milling um, this week and next, and then paving uh, the following week after that. All right. How far up? Just on MDTA's property, or I mean, uh, I noticed they milled, and that's well out of your. Uh, yeah. That, so that was uh, covering sort of that area that we need to reconfigure mm -hmm. because it used to be a four-lane section there. So oh, it definitely uh, it, needs it, it, yeah. it included that. Yeah. I might have to get you the exact limits. I, That's I, not, I'm just, I mean, I know it's off. I just was wondering how far back we were going to go with it. Jim, it's in the work areas, not That's continuous right. for the entire stretch. Right, right. Yeah. So probably back to the first gantry? Yeah. Okay. Should be in the areas that we would have disturbed or, or something, like, you know, that we need to modify. Okay. I, I can get you the exact mm -hmm. locations. Um, so which one? Okay. BB 3013, that was uh, the, <coughs> the new on-call uh, contract that I previously mentioned. So that'll be doing the same sort of priority steel, concrete, and miscellaneous repairs that we uncovered during our inspections. Um, I think that we, we gave the contractor notice to proceed in August and uh, they already have 10 task orders assigned to them. So we have a lot of work to do. All right. Moving down now, that was the end of the construction projects. We have three projects that are in design, the first of which is BB 2726. That's the um, rehabilitate the decks on uh, the eastbound span. This is phase one. Um, so this project uh, is going to perform eventually a major rehabilitation uh, of the, the eastbound bridge deck. Um, it also includes work on uh, the paint system for the for the eastbound bridge. Um, so we uh, recent accomplishments. We uh, gave the notice to proceed to our um, for pre-construction services or design services to our selected uh, contractor. Um, so that happened in July. We are working now with that contractor. Um, to develop the design and we're getting input and uh, soliciting feedback uh, on how best to go about this project so uh, one of you know that we like to um, just continue to mention that 
you know, we are designing and planning uh, this project to minimize uh, the impacts for uh, residents and for motorists. Um, this project is going to be uh, mostly performed off peak and by marine access, so they're going to be accessing the job from the water. Uh, it's this is not like the 2819 westbound overlay with a uh, full where there was a full time lane closure in place. Uh, we're going to be utilizing precast deck panels to, to drop into place so that we can do work, uh, remove a panel in the beginning of the shift at night, and, and put a new one back and, and be open to traffic in the morning. And if I could comment, that's the <clears throat> process that was used for the suspension span. That right, going westbound. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Through, through trust and, and suspension. And through trust and suspension. But, and that worked, yep. I have to say. So that was uh, two, around 2007 to maybe 2010. Yeah, a little, a little like later that. than that, I think. But, you know. A little later. Uh, yeah, so, several of us went, went up on top when that, that was happening. Coldest night of the year, you know. Of course. <laughs> but it worked. That that's, It sounds. Uh, now, you said. Yes. Sorry, keep talking. All right, thanks, Julie. Um, access from the water. That's right. Now, in the other one, the access right. was from the top of a flatbed truck. That's correct. So these things are going to be lifted up. The cranes, they'll have cranes wow. on okay. barges in the, in the. They're not going to be on suspension, though. These are going to be. That's correct. You're right. So, all right. Because I know with the suspension, there was a critical balancing uh, problem. That's right. If you took too many panels off, the bridge would fall over. So, but with the, yeah, this with is, the uh, press, this is, it's different. These are called, this is this section is called the deck truss panels. Okay. Um, so that is not, yeah, you're, it kind of is a butts to the suspension span, mm -hmm. but it's not the suspension span. Good. Thank you. are looking for a few good men out there if you've got some spare time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if I retire, I'll find some spare time. Train operators. <laughs> What's your... Just ballpark on what that project's going to cost. Um, we are, I think we are over uh, 200 million. 200 million? Yeah. Is that is that part of the number you were using for maintenance moving forward on the next? The 3.25. That's correct. Yeah. When you look, yeah. so for the record, my name is Will Pines. I'm Chief Operating Officer from the Maryland Transportation Authority. Thank you for inviting me this evening. Um, <laughs> Member Moran is referring to the 2015 life cycle cost mm -hmm. analysis report noted that there is 3.25 billion with a B dollars in maintenance needed on the existing two bridges out to 2065. This project was one of the major rehabilitations that was identified as, as necessary to keep the bridges serviceable through that period. Thank you. Okay. okay. All right, so let's see, that was 20. Okay, so uh, moving down to our next uh, project is in Design BB 3004, that is to uh, construct a new project management office as well as a maintenance equipment storage building. Um, so this is obviously not on the bridge, but on the campus here. Um, so. The, uh, the building will house our construction inspection uh, staff, and it will also provide a, a building, as I said, for, uh, for the, the maintenance equipment uh, for our trucks. Um, we also have some paving and, and storm drain, as well as a new 10-inch water main that will go in. Um, it will uh, upgrade this building up to, uh, to code for, the, for fire pressure, as well as the new, new buildings. Uh, so Excuse me. Where will those buildings be placed? Because I know they just won't be taken down until they're done. This building stays. This building stays. Oh, this building stays. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's actually at the end of the right road right here, bridge of the ferry okay. terminal. Where the ferry there's, terminal there's an existing um, the ferry terminal. Ferry one. terminal. Yeah. To, so okay. as, as the north of yeah, there's an old north of Grumman building there now. Um, and we'll sit tear down and demo that one and, and put you know, two buildings um, right there. Okay, and our last project is BB uh, 3012. It's the Q detection system. So we're going to work uh, on this 
project is an innovative project to um, to monitor uh, queues and, and travel times along US 50 approaching the bridge um, so that we can have an additional data point which will help to uh, feed into the decision making model uh, that operations utilizes for um, for making switches to two-way operations for when to implement or lift lane closures and so uh, this project is in coordination with um, State Highway Administration uh, and also um, UMD CAT Lab uh, which is developing uh, software uh, for this for this unique project. Uh, I guess with some of the equipment is under construction. We've got one site that uh, the, the University of Maryland is now utilizing for uh, running through their data to, to work on developing their software. And so we expect that the system would be um, fully deployed by spring of 2023. And that's all my projects. So if you have any questions, I can answer them now. Well, this, right. this will be available on the website. So it's part of the minutes. Uh, if anybody has any, you want to take it to a meeting or something, you can get it off of there. So newer members. So. Okay, as usual, thank you for your review. It's very informative and very interesting. So, okay. thank you. all right, next. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, Mr. Harkness focuses on the projects on the bridge. Uh, SHA has half mile to a mile on either side of the bridge, so we're, we're very much focused on, you know, kind of managing incidents as well as uh, handling disabled motorists. Uh, so the numbers I usually give you are related to that. So um, through 2021, just looking at my numbers right now, um, we have a total of almost a little over 1,100 uh, total between motorist assist and incidents handled. Um, in the in the corridor here for the eastern shore. How does that rank? <coughs> I mean, how does it, it, like the Beltway, the Baltimore Beltway, the Washington Beltway? I mean, that, that's a lot of incidents for seven miles. Agreed, but uh, if you the statewide numbers, we we're, we're still you know still what three quarters way a little more three quarters way through the year. We're right. roughly a little under forty four thousand total incidents and motor assist statewide. I can get you some numbers specifically for other corridors. I don't have those mm -hmm. unfortunately off the top of my head, but so we got 1,100 here. We got about 44,000. I mean, do you ever check in? I mean, I'm just, I'm sure the public's curious about it too, because you always see disabled vehicles. Uh, why all of a sudden a vehicle gets up on the Bay Bridge and just breaks down, you know, and scratches our head at that. But I just, I'm just curious if <clears throat> the state ever looks at that and goes, you know, your data says this stretch of seven miles for some reason has more of these incidents than anywhere else in a seven mile stretch in the, in the state of Maryland. I, I, I don't know, I just, I find that to be very, you know, interesting. We can drill down on the data a little more right. to help you um, and to look at that ourselves, to be honest with you. So, um, but I, I, I'm a stat geek at heart, um, baseball guy. Um, so I asked them to kind of pull some recent numbers too. So last year was a little bit of anomaly with just kind of COVID and everything. Um, but it was interesting that we still have roughly the same split between motorist assist and, dis and incidents. So uh, I like to say if we're, f we're addressing a disabled motorist, that's preventing an incident. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at numbers from uh, 2019, I think that's a little more, maybe a little more representative of where we were. So we were right around 800, a little over 800, so 828 total between motorist assist and incidents in this stretch in 2019 and through this this far so far this year we're r roughly at 1100 so um, I know last time um, I had uh, Joey Sagel my deputy administrator for Hanover operations kind of fill in for me uh, some updates I, I know he provided this but we kind of moved our our, our kind of more intense uh, patrols back to Thursday I mean, we, we used to start Thursday night we moved it to Thursday at noon um, and as the deputy secretary mentioned we started looking at further down on each side of our, our queues on where we seen uh, we're kind of tracking the travel times from different incidents just so we can see where the where where the flows are coming and where we can we expect a, a larger amount of traffic coming across the bridge so those are the quick numbers um, any questions or concerns for me I have a question mm -hmm. <clears throat> years ago before the construction started you could get the, the, the word was you get 1500 cars a lane go across the bridge I guess that was an hour um, and then on a good day you'd get more than that substantially more 
I think the back, I can't remember that young man's name, Bob. I think he was getting like 6,000 cars across the bridge in, in, in an hour and just as in the same three lanes. That was on a, on a good day, everything's perfect. With this construction and all this uh, road work, has there been a count? How did you average this year? Across the bridge, uh, that I would have to the lean three, on my yeah, MDTA. The three lane. Country. I'd have to lean on my MDTA folks for that. But the, the well, number, some of the numbers you were providing, you, you can't get six thousand vehicles well, across the lane. It was, it was more than the, the forty-five hundred. Okay. The th the th then fifteen hundred. It was more than that. Okay. Okay. And I and I remember those discussions. I mean, maybe somebody else here does. But this year, how did we average? Did you do? 1500 were you under that or was so there there's a lot of different ways to skin this cat this question okay <laughs> so if you looked at like what's referred to as the highway capacity manual right in like idealized conditions an open highway that has shoulders and good weather etc oh, yeah. that's closer to that 1500 number okay. um, what we experience Per hour, yeah. vehicles per, per hour. Per lane. Per yeah. lane. Per lane per, per hour. That's what we're that's right. what I thought sure about. At, at the Bay Bridge, especially on the bridges themselves, which the highway capacity manual doesn't typically deal with bridge structures, with configurations, with contraflow, mm -hmm. um, you will see significantly lower uh, capacities or throughput than than that 1500 number. Mm -hmm. um, Jim could probably give more numbers, but I mean, we're down the contraflow lane as low as 1100 at times. Obviously, if you get a disabled vehicle and issues oh, yeah. like that, then yeah. you drop down to zero. So um, it it's a difficult question to answer to say what is the average capacity okay. because you also hit points where you're constrained for other reasons. It just once you start to get jammed, right, your capacity may be great after you clear the jam. Mm -hmm. um, but so where are you talking on the bridge as an example? So you, the, averaging that is difficult. The studies that we've published, the the NEPA tier one has provided the assumptions for the lane capacities and the life cycle cost analysis that we has historically did has published the numbers that were used for those studies. So that's what I would kind of recommend sticking with um, for, for numbers that you might want to report to the public is what we publish specific to a specific study. You know, and again, if, uh, if, if you have lane closures, bad weather, the contraflow lane, any sun glare, all the reasons that we talk about here at the bridge, they'll they'll come down from that number. Jimmy, you want to add okay, anything? I think I, no, I think that's that's good. And it all plays into like Jim says, you know, okay, so you went from 800 to 1100 accidents, but you went from 1500 cars to let's say 1200 cars, you know, an hour. I mean, so just trying to get an idea of, you know. How this, how this construction has affected us and look forward to the fact when it's over with, we might be, we'll be 15, 1,600 cars and up maybe, who knows? You know, let, me, let me make sure, two, going again. two points. Okay. Um, one is that the construction that's ongoing right now is only closing shoulders, which does reduce by the highway capacity manual, it does reduce the, the throughput in a lane, and I'm, I'm not, it disturbs the pe person's mental uh, right. ability to drive through and get on the bridge and go across. But I, but I do want to correct one point uh, to, to make clear, which we stated at the last BRAG meeting, is that um, the idea that we're going to finish this construction and we're done, I, I just no, I hope that I can... construct a new bridge. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, obviously there's a lot of work to get through with the NEPA in order to advance that. But in terms of us, the MDTA, making sure that we make the appropriate investments to keep the bridge serviceable and open to the public, we have to do work on it. We yeah. cannot, uh, Jim showed you the list of projects that we have. I think it was a list of nine active construction projects, 12 total projects. That list is going to continue in perpetuity. I, we I, we have a lot of work planned, so I I, I sympathize with you. I moved over Eastern Shore '93 maybe, and um, 
Now I only drive across it four days a week, but it used to be five and six days a week. And it's there's never been not construction. Uh, right. There's always been something. You have lightning strikes that you fix that. I mean, you're always doing something. So, right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so our next is unfinished business, and Mr. Will Pines is in this driver's seat, so you might as well keep on going. Sure. Um, I don't know if you want to wait a moment. Charles is, yeah. is coming up. So this is a an item we had previously reported at at a, a brag meeting a couple of brags ago. Um, the first three pages of the presentation are items that were closed out at the prior meeting, but just for the record, we've we've uh, you know continuing to to show them, and they'll they'll be in the minutes um, for your record. I don't intend to go through every one of these items because we did report on them before, and from our perspective, they are complete. Not to say that they were completed to everyone's satisfaction, but they generally, uh, we've done what we can on them. So uh, the, just the first example was about providing the, the ferry study. Uh, we did provide a copy of that, but most of the information that was requested, we really do our best to post any information requested on our website so that we limit how many of these kinds of requests we have to repeat. So the ferry studies out there, the NEPA study, all of that is public record um, for, for your consumption. So I'm going to jump straight to the last slide, which is kind of the new community requests that um, we've been addressing recently. And, and uh, two items are a little older and dated, and w hopefully we can kind of give you some updates on that. So the first item is uh, support the return of the across the bay 10K. Uh, that we received a written request from the commissioners of Queen Anne's County and also the Anne Arundel County Executive. That event is currently planned for Halloween of this year. Do you have an update of the amount of runners they have signed up so far? Yeah. I heard attendance was down so far. Is that a Sunday? A Saturday. Sunday. Maryland Transportation Authority, Bay Bridge. Um, and I'll, I'll be providing a, uh, a brief four or five minute overview of uh, the uh, Bay Bridge run okay. after uh, Mr. Will Pines is complete. Is that Very good. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, then uh, the Bragg had requested to receive copies of the legal information about restricting ramp access to local traffic, uh, to local traffic only. That request is complete in the sense that we did provide the uh, information from the AG's office about um, why we cannot close the ramps. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Coates reached out to us about cones that are placed on uh, Old Ferry Slip Road. Uh, recently, Member Cole also kind of reiterated some of that concern. Uh, uh, Richard has reached out to Mr. Coates to resolve this concern, and we also have coordinated that with uh, Northrop Grumman. So that road is actually a private road here to our facility. It, there's no outlet. It's kind of different than the, the main public road, correct. Uh, <clears throat> next item uh, was a member request for the automated gates or the automated lane closure system graphic request. Those graphics now have been posted on our website for you to view. That includes uh, a video of what the construction will look like uh, on the eastern shore for the automated lane closure system and renderings of what the system will look like on the western shore. The next one is uh, ContraFlow Lane tractor trailer restriction. This uh, request had come in from Member Moran. You recently had kind of asked us to kind of yeah, it, yeah. continue the enforcement and possibly strengthen that. But we have uh, improved our messaging on our variable message signs on US 50, and our police have been increasing the enforcement. <laughs> and I'm watching your cameras, and I see them in, in the center lane, and, the, and the, you know yeah. so. Yeah. I, I, Anyways. I came behind yeah. one tonight yeah. in that center lane all the way across the bridge. Huge 18 wheeler. I thought, well, he didn't, he didn't get another the word. <laughs> yeah. Stop looking. <laughs> Anyways, appreciate that. No, I mean, the messaging is there. And before, before it was a small sign, and it, the, you know, the, the overheads, you know, it, it, I'm satisfied. So thank you. <laughs> Uh, the next one was to uh, participate in the Broadneck Council meeting. Uh, Member Ports and I actually did participate in the meeting uh, with 
uh, Pat Lynch on September 23rd of this year, and we provided a briefing and uh, a significant Q&A with the council uh, and several other elected officials who were in attendance. And so thank you for the invite to that. Uh, the next item is uh, a memorandum request to incorporate stay on 50 messaging within the baseband system. We are in the process of upgrading our IVR system for the baseband. That is in procurement right now and we do expect the procurement to be completed so that prior to next summer's travel season that message was stay on 50. Well and, and I think you know I think we requested like a, a, a the time lapse you know at Nesbitt Road for instance westbound when they come, when the merge comes together from 301 and 50, you know, uh, your your messaging boards are very effective. You know, on Route 50, as I go eastbound, it says 12 miles, or 13 miles, 14 miles, whatever it is, and how many minutes, and and it's spot on every time. You know, so I think those are an outstanding tool, and just to see when when they come to the merge lane, maybe they'll think twice before they jump off. And, and the messaging, you know, with all the signage that we do have that you've put up along Route 50, uh, moving. Uh, Westbound is working, and, and Tracy said that earlier, that you know we're not seeing those congestion on our back roads like we have in the past. So that message is working. I think that you know we need to now start uh, hopefully focusing on on Anne Arundel County side with the same thing with their Thursday through Sundays to keep that traffic off those side roads. So specifically with mentioning the travel time information, is that that request you're asking it to be in the baseband information? Well, it wouldn't hurt, but I, I mean, I'm talking about the visual boards when they when they come around the the bend there, they see it. You know, I know you have one further up uh, past Y Mills, but you know, when you add in 301 to it, and you know, I don't know if that factors in or not, but it just, you know, that's that first. There's really only three or four exits that they can get off on that cause congestion. So if we plant one of those signs before that, and they go look at it, it's it's 10 miles and it's 20 minutes. I'll stay and do the 20 minutes. Yeah, that's all. It just every little bit helps. So I think we did note the right. request to um, to increase the number of PBMS signs that we have out. Right. We'll take a look at what locations might okay. be able to improve that. Thank you. Related to. Oh. I'm sorry. Did Jim Jim requested to say something? Yeah. Jim, do you have a comment? Yeah. Yeah, uh, can you hear me okay? Uh -huh. Yes. Okay, great. So I want to go back to what uh, Jim Moran was saying about the uh, truckers and the, and the contraflow lane. So I did address that with our police officers. I think our police officers handed out, uh, quite frankly, a lot of a lot of tickets and a lot of warnings. But let me. But I do need to set some expectations, Jim. Um, let me ask you a question. Have you ever gone oh, fishing? I told you I was satisfied. I'm sorry, what was that? Have you ever gone fishing? Never. Fishing. Uh, yes, I have. <laughs> fish is in a barrel. Is all the fish? <laughs> some here and there. Well, I don't want to answer that question because it might incriminate me. <laughs> You're in a police building. The point, is, the point I'm trying to make is set expectations. You can't catch all of the fish. That's an unreasonable expectation for our police. But I will say that I think our police are doing a great job of keeping most of them off. It's just like speeders. You're not going to catch all of them, but you're going to catch a bunch of them. And so I think, I think we are addressing that, and I just want you to try and recognize that also. Mr. Ports, Mr. Moran said he was satisfied five minutes ago. You're off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> oh, off the hook. That's a good fishing one. That's good. <laughs> Another lost fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The one that got away. Well, just to be clear on the, the base span updates, mm -hmm. we do not provide the travel time information Correct. because right. we have MDTA and M.SHA, SHA, we have an agreement that their chart system, they provide travel times we provide distances and the reason for that is there was a period where we were providing travel times and they were providing travel times and our signs never matched and there was it, we got a lot of complaints about you, you five miles ago said it was only 10 minutes now you're saying it's 15 like what gives and it, it was essentially impossible to get on the same page with how we were calculating it, whether you're using stop condition, it's it's complicated. No. So we decided that the cleanest thing 
all of our information consistently is distances. Which is great. And those, those, those emails are outstanding. Yes. Speaking of signs, Jim, I think at the last meeting, which was on the computer, we, we talked about putting signs up for commercial vehicles to stay to the right lane because some of them are hitting contra flow. And did, did you, how far did y'all want to go to enforce that? Are you going to keep them out of the, um, so the, the, the two lane eastbound bridge or lanes four and five, do you keep them out of both of those lanes or you just, I mean, just want them in five or if the they're signs four, say are four and five, you're okay. Truck stay to the right lane only. And they put they put some electronic signs because I, I, I noticed that, and um, they just say you know stay to the right lane. I don't think they they don't. It is being enforced, as Jim Ports mentioned. Well, I, yeah. We have increased our police presence to, you, to enforce uh, that, but I mean, you know, like you're ticketing a panel, like a 30-foot panel truck, for instance, if it's in the um, um, if it's not in the right lane, you're going to ticket it. Candidly, I'm not sure yeah. which vehicles. I know you take you take a tractor trailer because that's that's an issue. I mean, there's definitely, especially on contra flow. I think it says commercial vehicles. Restriction. Yeah, that's what it says. Commercial over five ton. Is that what it is? Sent out of trucks okay. registered. Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the next item uh, was a member brought a request to have a federal highway expert represent the group on federal involvement in a uh, US 50 corridor analysis. Um, we, we talked about it before that, you know, Federal Highway is looking at the NEPA study, mm -hmm. which is a full corridor review uh, for the new bridge. It does include the no-build alternatives, so they're reviewing kind of the analysis for the existing conditions. Uh, but we haven't really fully advanced this, possibly not fully capturing what the what the goal is by having a federal expert here but i don't know tim if um sha you know we don't receive federal money for any of the existing bridge management so we're not exactly sure how this would would help um yes yeah, so i think one of the things we had in mind in that discussion was that the the issue really is the side roads and you know the the local counties and the neighborhoods are dealing with the side roads and our thought was that if not only the state level but the federal level were involved in trying to problem solve in dealing with the service roads or the side road, route 18 on the uh, eastern shore side that there could be some value there that was really how that how that discussion came okay. up so i think there's opportunities there I, I i on the queen anne sound county side those are federally eligible roadways on the anne arundel county side some of the side roads are currently not they're state only um roadways but we're currently pursuing opportunities giving uh the whole corridor and impacts on heavy congestion days trying to make them federally eligible, which gives us opportunities to, to, to leverage federal dollars to make different types of improvements. But I know I got to balance that both with the Queen Anne's and as well as the Anne Arundel County side as we move forward. I know um, Ken Island has their, their transportation plan looking at pedestrian and, and bicycle improvements. We, we would probably need to prop up something very similar on the Anne Arundel County side, especially for Skidmore and, um, um, and College Avenue, if that makes sense. You're looking at me puzzled. I'm thinking that doesn't make sense. Yeah, it it does. I guess you know, like Jim Moran said, you know, every little bit helps. Mm -hmm. And you know, if there's some solution that they might be able to bring to the table, they may, be, you know, to have them be part of the problem-solving process, seem to make sense. That part seems to make sense. Agreed. Kind of an ongoing issue. Okay. I guess, you know. <laughs> But thanks for yeah, and keeping it. Yeah, we definitely are working with our yeah. federal partners and particularly on the NEPA study, which again is a corridor analysis. Yeah. So it, I, I think it's safe to say there is federal involvement in, mm -hmm. in what we're doing, uh, but to what degree, wh where the line stops, I, I don't, yeah. I'm not okay. sure what, yeah. what, how much involvement you were looking for. Ongoing problem solving, I guess, <laughs> okay. is the issue. 
Okay, the next item was uh, something Senator Riley had requested about restricting large commercial trucks from using St. Margaret's Road as well as the north and south service roads except for local delivery. Um, again, this kind of falls into the similar bucket of challenges that we've had with legal restrictions to to the local roads. Um, so that is, to the best of my knowledge, still being evaluated. And of course, um, restricting trucks in general can be a challenge with, uh, with the trucking industry. So I don't know if you have anything further, Tim, on this item. Was it focused just on St. Margaret's or all, all roadways, I guess? It's it's St. Margaret's Road. St. Yeah. Margaret's and then the North and South Service Road. Okay. So with that, uh, we, we at least did some analysis on that. The, right now we have roughly 4,500 vehicles using that roadway um, per day. And based on the truck counts we have, it's between 125 and 150 vehicle or truck trucks on that location each day. Based on what was kind of framed in terms of the what we could potentially restrict is it would only be 54 trucks. And then the challenge we have, and, and we'll kind of mention well just from a legal standpoint, is uh, you know you have a side farm there that has a lot of vehicles going in and out of it that meet that criteria. So. Uh, when you boil it down, we might have 10 trucks a day that might not be doing something purposely on that roadway and it might be cutting through. So then it becomes a law enforcement issue. So we, we partnered with Anne Arundel County to look at that oppor opportunity. Uh, it, it boils down to, you know, we'll move forward with what the, the, the Bragg group would like to move forward with, but there, I guess the concern is, is the juice worth the squeeze there trying to look at Ten trucks on St. Margaret's Road that might be just passing through and not having actual commercial business, either at the sod farm or deliveries throughout that corridor. So, I would my observation and experience is that rarely ever see large trucks on East College Parkway. Almost never. When the backups occur, it's passenger cars. The only only big vehicles on East College Parkway typically are. And, and it, they can barely fit. The road is, is with the with the guardrails up against the road, the road width. I, I see school buses in the morning that are two or three feet over the yellow line because it's so narrow. So perhaps that's why the trucks don't use it. But anyway, the point being, that's not the problem for East College Parkway. And I think similar with Whitehall and Skidmore. Every now and then you'll see a truck coming up around the ramp. But anyway, that's my observation. Good. So the, it sounds like for this specific request, the Bragg is generally satisfied that we can close this out based on the, the metrics and information provided. I'm good. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And then the, uh, the last item here, stay on 50 signage on Route 50, uh, Delicate Bagnall had requested this and MDTA and MDOT SHA are uh, currently considering some signing concepts to, to look at opportunities to improve that stay on 50 signing. It, you know, we understand there's the request to have local only signing, but again, we've talked about the legal issues with that. So the stay on 50 signing, like what we have on the Eastern Shore, is not problematic. It's just um, having the funds programmed and getting the signing contracts and the design and, and targeting the right locations to have this. You could put maybe, I think about it, I don't know if it's work or not, but if you could put a sign up that says it had digital readouts on it. ETA to Bay Bridge, a lot of people don't know what ETA means, but <laughs> ETA to Bay Bridge by Route 18 Main Street, 50 minutes, by staying on US 50, 20 minutes. You know what I mean? In the same way coming this way. Fudge that, ETA to, add a couple minutes. Well, I'm not operating. <laughs> <laughs> College Parkway or it's, it's, it's so, or it's, so to your Margaret, point, maybe it would um, be, it, people say, I'm not going on St. Margaret's because it's going to be 40 minutes. If I stay on 50, it'll be 20 minutes. To your point, I don't know. So. That it that is implying that staying on 50 is typically actually faster right. than taking the side routes. Uh, this summer, we did some actual analysis of that to with the goal of being able to challenge some of the apps and to try to be able to go to them with data 
and say the community routinely tells us that you're wrong and because you're wrong we want you to work with us or we're going to let everybody know how wrong you are. Fortunately, that's not what we found. We found that the apps are actually really accurate and tend to be right. Damn. Um, so if we were to put something that would post travel times, it would probably convey a message that you wouldn't want. Um, put mileage on it because the main street's longer than 50. Mm -hmm. Just years on <laughs> yeah, from a distance perspective, but yeah, that's, I mean that's true. Sure. Um, we could look at that. Some cuts arrive. We see a bigger number. Like oh, I'm staying away from the bigger number. I'm going to lower number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Next slide. <laughs> it's really, it's really big. Number. Well, that was all that I have uh, on the, the, you know, close out of community requests. Are there any questions on any of the items? I think I'll turn it over to Richard to Richard give the paper to run and run up the. I do have one question before this part of the whole business closes up, and this is going to be an odd one because I don't want the answer now. I'd like to have it at the next meeting. And I throw this at our uh, house statistician here, Mr. Smith. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, that it's been. You can understand the correlation in between the growth of the economy and the shrinkage of the economy and traffic. And when you're as close to capacity running this facility as we are, fairly moderate changes in traffic can throw traffic jams in place or not. So that anticipating what's coming up is, is a fairly interesting calculation to make. And uh, one of the things that interests me is we know that the the traffic goes up and down with the economy, but also fuel prices may be fairly involved in it. And if you go back to the 70s when we had that huge fuel pop, it would be interesting to take a look at the numbers and see how that affected your traffic. Because right now in the last year, you've had crude oil move from 40 bucks a barrel up to 78 bucks today. That's going to be flowing through pretty quickly. And. Uh, I, I'd be interested in any thoughts you had on what effect that might or might not have, just not for now, but sometime. So just so I capture it correctly, you're, you're interested in what the fuel costs impact our traffic, traffic Absolutely. volumes? Absolutely, okay. because I think you get, you get crossover points like $3 to 340 doesn't do much, but 450 and 5 bucks, all of a sudden you'll see a pretty quick break in traffic growth. So. There's a whole lot of and that's there. going to give you quite a read during the winter of the next summer. So there's a whole lot of new, uh, I think, issues coming up with gas prices going up. Oh. Probably in the government Safety. switching their by electric vehicles. Yeah, with that. Means. So when you have a backup at the bridge that lasts for how long does it take you to get from D.C. to the Bay Bridge? Two hours sometimes. How long does a charge an electric vehicle last? Mm -hmm. Where is it going to die at? <laughs> it's going to die before the, the bridge, on the shoulder, <laughs> on the bridge. I think there's a whole lot of issues that are going to be new to absolutely like this the state highway and to the transportation down. authority yeah. that's going to be how you cause gonna, new problems. How are you going, going to clean up all that battery house so they have an accident? That's a new business to start. Yeah. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> but it's going to be. I think it's going to be a whole new oh, yeah. set of. Uh, <laughs> parameters that are going to affect traffic in general over the years. I mean, you sit here and have snow on the bridge or anywhere to say you had a blizzard somewhere and it's shut down the highway and you have people sitting in electric cars, what's going to happen? Yeah, well, anywhere, not just here, but in any place where the traffic is congested, it right. could be up and down the Jersey Turnpike, wherever right. you happen right. to be, down in Beltway. Richmond with the 95, all that stuff going on down there. So, so that's, going to be, that's going to be a whole new set of problems going to be coming to areas that are congested like this. And, I mean, people are going to be sitting in their cars in the summer, sitting in traffic, want their air conditioner on, the battery only lasts so long. So you and I have had this conversation. I think I said the first electric car was invented in 1811 or something like that, and it hasn't caught on yet for some reason. So it'll be interesting to see where it's it goes. It's not what catching on is what being forced on. Yeah, that's so the problem. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Member, right. member Ports noted, to, to Commissioner Wilson's question, Member Ports noted at a prior meeting that for our NEPA study traffic analysis, we're using regional models that are, those models are designed to 
look at zoning and try to estimate sure. what to expect in the future. Right. I'd like to think that they're subject matter experts when they <laughs> develop these models uh, and, and contemplate the types of things that, that you're, you're raising here. But the simple answer from our perspective is every traffic analysis that we do is showing that the traffic's going to get worse. Oh, not the, uh, that, that, that's not the simple. Not a question. I'm interested. You know, when you hit the 2007 through nine, you probably lost how much of your traffic? 20 percent, 15. Bay Bridge traffic between 2007 and 2009. What was the drop in? With fuel, when with fuel? Oh, yeah, just the gross number of vehicles across the bridge, and that from the peak to the back. Because that was a was that was a recession era. Yeah, no, it affected your your traffic by you know 10 or 20 percent. Jim's well, trying to jump in here. Yeah, I just I don't want to back back Will up for a second. Um, you know, when you talk about these traffic models, I mean, you you have first of all you have one of the best traffic engineers in the state, probably one of the best in the country, with with Jim here. But but two. <clears throat> And I mentioned this the other night at Broadneck. <laughs> I have a study dating back to 2006. And in 2006, they predicted that by 2020, we would be seeing a volume of cars at the 100,000 mark. And that is exactly where we are right now. We're between Oh, and I'm talking about during peak summer days. We are between 98,000 and 103,000 on peak, uh, during peak times on the weekends. So when you talk about these studies and, and saying that, you know, they may not predict the right traffic, I'm telling you, we have one from 2006 that predicted it in 2020, and they were dead on. So... I'm not sure where the criticism comes in, but I'm fascinated by the traffic studies and how they are able to do some of this stuff. Much like when you're doing economic development and zoning and stuff like that, how you predict how many you know, residents are going to be there and all that stuff. These planners do a good job of predicting that in their analysis. Jim, this is Steve Wilson. I didn't challenge the predictions at all. I just was curious. Oh, okay. I was only curious about the effects of fuel price. Yeah, I apologize because the, the, unfortunately when I'm on the uh, Teams site, everything is like, you know, it's it's very difficult for me to, to catch all of the, uh, the conversation because it's so broken up. But um, I did hear Will talk about, you know, right. how we follow the procedures and, and you know, all all the procedures that we follow for traffic analysis is is backed up by the federal government too with the NEPA study. And so, um, just like they're looking at the entire corridor, 21.22 miles uh, of that area between Route Boulevard and 5301 Split. So, so we are having the federal government get involved in that. We are looking at the traffic analysis, and so yeah, I apologize, Steve, if, I, if oh, I'm no. not hearing quite everything, but I just wanted to back Will up because uh, you know he does such a great job. No, I'm I'm sorry you missed me because I was nothing but complimentary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll go on to the <laughs> Richard. Get on with the about the update on the. Say run. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, uh, again, for the record, my name is Richard Haramillo, Maryland Transportation Authority Bay Bridge Administrator. Just want to give you a uh, four or five minute overview of the uh, upcoming uh, Bay Bridge run for 2021. Um, and the Bay Bridge run is back with a new event organizer. Uh, and uh, it's a relaunch of basically the Across the Bay 10K, uh, which took place from 2014 to 2018. Um, and um, the uh, previous uh, owner, Iron Man, has decided uh, di to discontinue in early 2021. So we have a new event organizer who is uh, it's Corrigan Sports. Um, the, uh, the owner is uh, Lee Corrigan. He's, he's a local from uh, Elkridge, Maryland. Um, and uh, so 
Um, we've been working with them. Been, it's been a real pleasure working with uh, Lee and, and his folks. It's, it's been wonderful. The, um, as, um, as Will mentioned, uh, the date of the event is October 31st, uh, yes, Halloween. And uh, the race will begin around 6.45 a.m. Uh, with the bridge reopening by 2 p.m. The uh, start location is on the Northrop Grumman uh, facility here on the western shore. And the finish location will be at the Chesapeake uh, Business Park, which is on uh, Queen Anne's County side on the eastern shore. Uh, this event is weather dependent, and there is no rain date. Um, so it happens or it doesn't. Um, and um, there are two MOU agreements for it. Uh, one is with Corrigan Sports and Queen Anne's County. Uh, the other is uh, between uh, MDTA and Corrigan Sports. Um, the, just a brief overview, because I know a few folks aren't familiar with the actual event. So um, again, weather permitting, the participants will start on the western shore here in the Anne Arundel County side. Uh, from Northrop Grumman, run west on Old Ferry Slip Road onto US 50, and then across the uh, two-lane eastbound bridge. Uh, they'll cross a footbridge just after they get off the eastbound bridge uh, onto Pier 1 Road towards uh, Hemingway's restaurant. They'll turn left and run northbound on, um, on the shoulder on Route 8, south, and then left onto Skipjack Parkway to the finish line. Uh, and so uh, that's essentially the course. The number of participants as of today around noon uh, were 9,724 registered. Um, in speaking with uh, Corrigan Sports, they're anticipating somewhere around maybe getting 11, 11 uh, come race day. Uh, just as a point of reference, our last uh, event was, was held in 2018. The final total was 14,773. So it's, it's, uh, it's down, but all the events, I think, nationwide right. have been uh, due to COVID and various other reasons. Um, again, based on the number of participants this year, uh, the runners will be sent in waves beginning at 6.45 uh, for the special needs participants. The next wave will begin at 7 a.m. and continue every 15 minutes uh, intervals uh, till approximately 8.30 or 9. Again, a lot of that is dependent upon the number of participants that we have uh, come race day. Uh, the object objective is to have all the runners off the bridge by 11.30 a.m. based again on what we're seeing right now as the numbers and reopening the bridge somewhere uh, open to traffic somewhere around noon, one at the very latest, again based on what we're seeing as the numbers today. Um, the, we have had uh, plenty of several public safety meetings with the participating ag agencies, which have been numerous and many, um, and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of good um, uh, information and, and public safety and safety and security, uh, primary and paramount. Um, and I know that Mr. Chair has, has been a member of uh, uh, part of some of those uh, conversations. Um, again, although the event is on Halloween, participants are prohibited from wearing costumes during the event. Um, although some people would say that I have one on at all times. So, um, the current CDC requirements uh, mandate the wearing of PPE um, masks on the buses. Um, so uh, they'll be required, the participants will be required to wear the PPE masks uh, when they arrive to the shuttle locations and wear them on the buses. Um, we will have five weather calls with uh, NOAA, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, beginning <coughs> Wednesday, October 27th, uh, and we'll run every day with the last call, the fifth call, being on Sunday race day at 3.30 a.m. to determine a go or no-go based on the weather. So 3.30 will be a no go or no-go um, Sunday morning? Yes, sir. Uh, again, curr um, currently we have 32 states represented. Um, of the, the participants that we have to date of the 9,744, 64% of them are female and 36% are male. Amazing. And the average age is 44. Oh, yeah. uh, so a little bit of interesting uh, information there. A um, the little um, note here, motorists using the Bay Bridge on October 31st will experience significant delays throughout the day. Uh, to avoid delays, we are asking motorists to, and they're urged to travel before 6 a.m. and after 6 p.m. 
And the MDTA uh, always thanks its customers for their patience and reminds them to stay alert so no one gets hurt. And that's about all I have, Mr. Chair. I have a question. Uh, yes. What has past experience been on the revenue impact of this event? Does it have any impact on the revenue, the daily revenue? Uh, revenue to... Bridge tolls. To the bridge tolls? Yes. Uh, well, there's uh, obviously, it. Uh, we see less traffic because we're asking them to travel at different times. Uh, so I imagine there's yeah, some overall. some impact, but it's small. I guess it's small. Okay. Yeah, Can because you what you do is you have those people. You're forcing them into Saturday or Monday or whatever. They just change their their driving uh, their days or hours or times. Okay. Yeah. So you, re you recommend putting uh, easy pass on the uh, runners? Oh yeah. Put <laughs> <laughs> slips on them. <laughs> Slip on everyone's back. That's right. Yeah. Here, take this with you. That bridge makes a lot of money. Yeah. Yes, okay. yes, I, have, I have a question, sir. Um, what, what would the, for the general public, what would the drivers, what should they expect um, when they're going across the westbound span um, between those hours? So, so between those hours, what, what will happen is we will go into two-way ops beginning Saturday night, uh, somewhere around 10, 11 p.m., okay. uh, depending on traffic volumes. Uh, we will stay in, in the contra flow on the westbound bridge um, through Sunday until after the event. Um, and so, uh, so essentially, the heading uh, eastbound, you will be going in one lane, uh, gotcha. beginning somewhere around Saturday night. When again, this. that's when traffic volume drops really low, 10, 11 p.m. ish, um, through the uh, uh, duration of the event. Okay. It, yeah, and then obviously there would, it would be this. very difficult to do any switching in and out because of the runners and, and what we have going on. So. Switching and in. switching in and out of, of two-way ops. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We couldn't because the eastbound bridge would be completely exactly. Closed. Yeah, there there would be no way to exactly. Yes. So as long as I just wanted to give people like a general idea of what they're going to expect when they drive up to the bridge. Yes. Knock on wood. I don't know how many years we've done this. It's been incident free. Mm -hmm. It actually it actually works. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and uh, just one other, one last point um, uh, to uh, Member Powell's uh, question: uh, the you know when we go into the contra flow lane, we will have the center lane uh, that we use as a buffer lane, right? Uh, primarily for safety and security reasons, okay. but also to alleviate possible westbound delays if necessary, and or again for safety reasons right. uh, if we need to get emergency personnel across in either direction. Right. So it'll main you'll maintain the center lane as the buffer. In extreme conditions, we may use it for, for traffic flow. Otherwise, it's going to be for safety, um, access for the safety vehicles. Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay. Yes. Do you have anything else? I don't. Any other questions? I think everybody's good. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Our next item will be Melissa, we have any public comments? Can you place a call? Patents any? registered to speak. That's the only one. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Curtis Cook, but I don't believe he makes the Lynch. I'm Pat Lynch. I'm president of the Broadneck Council. Hi, Jim. And I just wanted to say thank you to Jim Ports and to Will Hines for the work they've done on contraflow traffic, uh, trying to help us out on the western shore. We've seen a significant improvement this year, and uh, we're very grateful for that. It's been a tough experience to be backed up in traffic all weekend. I know I don't go in <coughs> from Thursday to Sunday now. And it's pretty tough, but we, we've seen some, some really good moves by you all, and thank you. Okay. That's the only public comment. Mr. Coach is not here. Okay. So our next meeting will be scheduled to take place on Wednesday, January the 5th. 2021 on there. I got wow. 20, you always messed me up. That's 2022, okay. actually. That's 6 p.m., so I'm right here. And uh, so within the next three months, can we try to get our uh, Queen Anne TV and our whoever with Melissa and get our mojo one with the <laughs> teams and uh, TVs and all that stuff so everybody can talk and we'll, we'll have a recording posted tomorrow or the next day we have a good recording for those that didn't hear well on okay. the team's team. it's like for Jim the ports to be able to communicate in and stuff that's yeah. a major issue sometimes for him to be able to speak and could be there's a question needs to be answered or something but well I appreciate if he, if he wasn't out fishing he could probably be here <laughs> you know, so. well, if he was catching he would probably have been in one hell like oh he wouldn't have been able to call call catch him. Him. Yeah. So you called him all so he's trying to catch that's him. it yeah so, all right can I have a motion for adjournment 
Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you all. Have a good, safe trip home, and we'll see you on Thank you. January, January the 5th.